God, today as we come and we spend some time in your word together, I pray that first and foremost you will rekindle a love for your word and your messages to us through the word that you've given to us. God, today I know that as we begin this time of spending time in your word, that you have something for each and every one of us in this place today. And that God, as we talk about the discipline of study, but specifically the study of your word, that God, you will bring into flame in each of our lives a desire and a compelling to give ourselves to your word. For God, it is a discipline that we take sometimes too lightly. Sometimes we take for granted. Or some things, God, sometimes we just give it no attention at all. But Father, for those of us who profess to follow you and to follow Jesus Christ and to be known by you through him, it's your word that should guide every part of who we are, every facet of our lives. And so God, today, as we talk about the importance and devotion of study, I pray that you'll just really speak to us and empower us in a way, God, to desire more and more every day an intimacy with you and your word. God, we love you. and We thank you for what you've done already in this place today. And I pray, God, that you'll continue to move in our hearts and that we will respond with great obedience to you. Uh, we love you and we thank you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. We started last week a new series called Digging Deeper. And uh, we talked about kind of an introduction to spiritual discipline. And last week we talked about how for many people, spiritual discipline was like how you get into the pool. If you'll remember, you've got some tiptoers, some waders and some jumpers. And so we kind of wade into this together uh, today as we talk about the first discipline uh, the discipline of study and more importantly, the discipline of the study of God's word. Um, I want to mention to you before we start today at the bottom of your worship folder uh, in the notes section, you're going to see a resource listed there called Seven Arrows. It's a book by Matt Rogers and Donnie Mathis. And this resource uh, is something that you can purchase that will help you and help guide you in the things that we talk about today in the discipline of study. You can buy that at a lot of places. You can check it out in our resource center over in the Welcome Center as well. But I, I want you to understand that that resource will help you in your desire to become a better student of the Word of God. It's a great way to do it. It's a very simple way to do it, but it will get you from the tiptoe into the waiting in a little bit to develop that discipline in your life. And so I want you to check out that resource, whether you do it uh, at home this afternoon or whatever the case may be. But uh, any questions you have about that, let us know. Jonathan and I both know this resource. And, and so we want to make sure that you have that. Um, you know, we talked a little bit last week that practicing spiritual discipline is never easy. No discipline to be practiced is ever easy. Um, but it's kind of like being asked that age-old question, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer to how you eat an elephant is what? One bite at a time. One bite at a time. Because I know that when we talk about spiritual discipline and we talk about things like we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, like studying God's word, prayer, simplicity, stewardship, service, and we begin to take a spiritual inventory of our lives and we're honest with ourselves, we're going to get overwhelmed. We're going to say about ourselves and about different things, man, if this is what studying God's word like, I am terrible at it. Or like, man, my prayer life is so bad. Or worship, I just, I can't worship because I don't know the words or I just, I don't know what to do about it. Or I'm not serving God enough. And all of a sudden, what God meant for our good to grow closer to him becomes this overwhelming pouring over us. Kind of like when you take your kids to the water park and they got that really big bucket that all the kids wait for that bucket to be turned over. I can tell you as an adult, that bucket hits me faster than it hits the little ones and it hurts. And if you go and you just, it's crazy. It's just it's pouring over. You're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? And we enter into this stage of panic because we feel like we're lagging behind. And so then what do we do? After we take this inventory and we see all these places that we're lacking, we come up with this impossible plan to tackle every discipline every day of every week 
And then and in seven days, I'm going to be much better off in my relationship with God than I was a week ago. And you can do it for like one day, but then on Tuesday, you're like, there ain't no way. How do I up my study of the word and my prayer time and my worship? And how do I be a better dad? And how do I be a better husband? How do I make all these things come to work in my life? Listen, that is never a good idea. You don't have to be a hero. You know the quote, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? And all the things that may be lacking in our life didn't just start lacking yesterday. You didn't just go from super Christian to no Christian in a matter of 24 hours. And spiritual discipline is hard, and it's not easy to make that plan. But the goal of spiritual discipline, hear me today, because I know you can get discouraged when we start thinking about things like that. What's the goal of spiritual discipline? It's not to highlight our inadequacy or how we're failing God miserably in areas, right? What did we learn last week? To train ourselves for righteousness, to pursue what? Godliness. Pursue it, not arrive at it. And so anything, listen, anything that we do when we talk about the study of God's word today, anything that you do today or tomorrow that you didn't do yesterday is a pursuit. You don't have to memorize the Old Testament by Wednesday. or You don't have to do all these kinds of things. Don't get overwhelmed. God designed disciplines for us to grow closer to him, not to feel farther away from him. But highlight the areas of life that we need. We've got to have this mindset as we go forward in this, that we are a work in progress if you are progressing. We can't lose that as a crutch. We can't say, well, you know, know, the little kid song that I used to sing, he's still working on me. Well, maybe he is, but are you working on yourself, right? We're a work in progress as long as we are progressing. Small steps, baby steps, big steps, right? So when we talk about discipline, our ultimate desire is to bring these practices into our life, right? That help us to move from being what I like to call about my life sometimes, consistently inconsistent, right? To move us from there to being purposeful as we pursue this life that God has called us to in Jesus Christ. That's an overwhelming task. I want to share with you as we talk about the study and the discipline and the study of God's word, this quote from Donald Whitney. Now, Whitney, I referenced a little bit last week, one of the great writers in spiritual discipline, and he says these words. No spiritual discipline is more important than the intake of God's word. Hear that again. No discipline is more important than the intake of God's word. Why is that? He says it in the next sentence. Because absolutely nothing is a substitute for the word of God in your life. Now, I know some of you all will say, well, you know, I worship every day and worship is phenomenal, right? But it still doesn't replace the word of God in your life. We worship because we know what the word says about worship and we worship who the word talks about in our lives. There's nothing that can be a substitute for it. You can't order a book from Amazon. You can't just pick it up in a Bible study. The word of God is the ultimate source of all spiritual discipline. Why? Because it outlines discipline in our lives. There is no substitute for the word of God. But what's sad, I think, for a lot of us as we are believers in Jesus Christ is that the one thing that we need most into our lives is the one thing that we are so unfamiliar with. And we make up and we justify our lack of study of the word of God for a lot of reasons. Well, I don't understand it. Or I don't know where to start. Or I don't know. And all of those can be concerns. But understand, we eat the elephant one bite at a time. So when we talk about the study of God's word, there's a few things that I want to bring to our attention this morning, starting with this. First thing is this, we have to be mindful of our approach when it comes to studying the word of God. I'm going to read a couple passages to you here in a minute, but I want us to get our minds wrapped around this, right? We have to be mindful of our approach toward the study of the word of God. But in order to do that, that means that we have to be able to accept some truths into our lives to build forward. You want to talk about building on a firm foundation. Um, you know, the wise man built his house on, or the foolish man built his house on the what? Sand, right? The wise man built it on the rock. Well, if you're going to build a discipline, you have to build it on a foundation, And the foundation that you place before you is only as much trust as you put in that foundation to be good. 
I've watched some of these houses going up, being built around in our area, and they pour the concrete slab. And my understanding is you're supposed to wait like 30 days for that to cure. But in three days, there's a house sitting on it. And I don't know what's going to happen to that house in two years. I'm not sure of the foundation. When you build your life on the Word of God, you better be sure what you know and believe about the Word of God in and of itself. So there's two or three things I just want to give to you this morning under here. I didn't put these on there. You can write them in. So these are some truths that we got to believe first and foremost. And you're going to say, well, that's simple. Well, yeah, it is until you put your words to it. Number one is this. You have to believe that the Bible is, in fact, the Word of God. You have to have a reverence and an understanding and acceptance that the word of God has been given to us by God as the inspiring word of God and that it matters in our lives. It's not someone's opinion. It's not someone's take on what God said, but the word of God is God's word. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16, the first part we talked about it last week, said that all scripture is inspired by God. It is his word. So therefore, your view and your acceptance or rejectance of his word, its truth and its application in your life, that matters. You do not want to build your life on something that you do not believe is true. We see people do it all the time. We see people build their lives on a prosperity gospel that isn't true. But you have to have in your mind an understanding that the book that I am studying right here, the word of God is the word of God. It is not. And here I want you to hear this. It's not a book of suggestion, but as Whitney kind of says, it's a book of ingestion, meaning that we take it in. That biblical intake is the most important discipline. It is God's word. It's his design and it's his command. If you do not believe that, then building your life on anything else is going to be a foundation like that house that in six months may not stand. We have to first believe that the Bible is the word of God. But secondly, we also have to believe what the Bible says about itself is that the word of God is sufficient for you. It is enough. We mentioned again last week, the rest of that second Timothy passage. That's the word of God. Uh, and it is profitable for your teaching for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Hear the truth of that. Not only do you have to believe that this is the word of God, but you have to believe that the word of God is sufficient in correcting what we believe about God to what God says about who he is. For example, those things it talks about in that passage for teaching and for rebuking and for correcting and for training all of those things we like to superimpose on other people, do we not? Like, well, I can take you to the word of God and say, hey, hey, for your life, this book is good for rebuking you and teaching you and correcting you and all those kinds of things. But understand when Paul writes this to Timothy, the first person that's taught, the first person that is rebuked or corrected or trained is not everybody else, but first and foremost, me. That the word of God is useful and profitable and sufficient to teach me what I need to know about God, to rebuke me and say, what you're doing is not what God says. It's not his command. Your way is not his way. To correct, to bring our line and our thoughts back in line with God, to train us to pursue godliness. So you have to believe that it's God's word and you have to believe it is sufficient Second Peter chapter one, we read this verse last week. I'm just going to read it to you again. If you're writing it down, it's second Peter one, three through eight it says his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and his goodness down in verse five. So for that very reason, you make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection. We are to not only trust the word of God, but we have to know it is sufficient. Why? Because if we possess these qualities in increasing measure, the expectation of growth, they will keep us from being useless and unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I think so many people today find themselves feeling useless and unfruitful. Why? Because we've settled for salvation, which is awesome, but we've neglected to engage in what life is like when we walk with God through his word. The third thing is this. We have to understand the difference between studying God's word and reading it devotionally. Studying it and reading it devotionally. What is the catch there? There's two different priorities in those two things. Both are good, but different priorities. 
Study. What is the goal of study? The study, uh, the interpretation of, of the word of God is, is the goal of the study of the word of God. What does that mean? It means what does God mean in this context? What does he mean? When we read it devotionally, it's how does this apply to my life? And there are two different approaches when we study that. I love what Richard Foster said about this because I think every person in this room has been there at some point in time. I know I have in my life. This is what he says. He says, too often people um, trust, uh, they run to the application stage and they bypass the interpretation stage. They want to know what it means for them before they know what it means. Anybody been there? I've been there. I want to open my Bible and say, what does this mean to me? Before I understand, God, what did it mean to you? Why did you give it to this? He continues, when we study the Bible, study the Bible, we are determined to hear what the author is saying, not what we want him to say. Daily devotional reading is commendable, but it's not study. One of the things that I read in an article talks about if we just read the word of God devotionally to give us that quick bit to get through the day, we're just going to get through the day. But when we study the word of God and we say, God, what is it? What do you mean? And how does this apply to me? So how we approach it, studying the Bible is one approach. Reading it devotionally is another. Both are good, but they both accomplish different purposes. And I can tell you this, your devotional life will be much better when your study life is better because you will have a greater understanding of what's going on. So let's talk about what we have to do. You know, last week we talked about some things that um, talk about spiritual discipline. We mentioned five or six things last week where spiritual discipline had to come from. They had to be practiced together. Here's one of those things. We talked about it being rooted in the word of God. And so I want to talk about this today when we study the Bible. Let's expose the roots a little bit uh, for just a moment this morning. There's two passages listed under there. You can write them down. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It's a very, very common passage of Scripture. But here's one of the roots of God's command that people study and come to know him through his word. The first couple of verses uh, in this, in chapter uh, 6, verses 4, is called the Shema. Y'all know the Shema. You've heard this a million times probably. But this is God's instruction to his people when he says this, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That is the Shema. That is God's command to recognize him for who he is and how to practice this faith that we have in him. Verse 6 picks up. These words that I am giving to you. What words? Well, he's referring back to the Ten Commandments. We'll talk about that in one second. These words uh, that I am giving you today, they are to be in your heart. You are to repeat them to your children. You are to talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road. When you lie down, when you get up. You are to bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. You are to write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. When Moses is writing in Deuteronomy, anybody know what the word Deuteronomy means? Some of you biblical great scholars in here. Duo means what? Two. All right. It's a second law. It's the second law. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, you can look over this, it's not a big deal. You see the Ten Commandments, and you say, well, what about Exodus 20? Well, understand that a new generation of God's people are about to go into the promised land. There's a problem, though, for those people who are about to go to the promised land. Two big things. Number one, they didn't see what God did at the Red Sea, and they didn't see what happened on Mount Sinai. And they needed to be reminded of the importance of engaging the word of God. They didn't have that experience. And so when we read in, in Deuteronomy 6, we're seeing God's command to stay engaged with his teaching so that it may dictate the way that we live our lives. Studying the word of God and being engaged in the word of God helps to dictate and should dictate the way that we live our lives. Now, I threw Ezra 7.10 in there to give you another idea that God commands it in Deuteronomy. But in Ezra 7, chapter 10, we see man obeying God's call. Ezra 7, verse 10, simple verse. Now, Ezra had determined in his heart to what? Study 
the law of the Lord, to obey it and to teach its statutes and ordinances in Israel. One commentary that I read sums it up like this. Ezra was the second of three key leaders to leave Babylon for the reconstruction of Jerusalem. You had Zerubbabel who constructed the, reconstructed the temple. Nehemiah rebuilt the what? The wall. But Ezra restored worship. Ezra would be the priest that would lead worship. Look at the traits in Ezra's verse in Ezra 7.10. What does it say? Ezra 7.10, simple. He determined in his heart to study the law of the Lord, to obey it, and to teach its statutes and ordinances in Israel. When we look at Deuteronomy 6, and we look at Ezra 7, not only do we get this command that God says, do this, then we see someone who obeys it, which gives us not only some hope that if Ezra, through the power of God, can do it in his life, guess what? So can you and so can I. We can pursue a study of the word of God. So let's look at that. We talk, This is the kind of the roots. And last week, we also talked about that spiritual discipline is not an attitude. But anybody remember? But it is a it's an action. So let's embrace the action. Let's look at this. In both of these roots passages, Deuteronomy 6, Ezra 7, we see a genuine commitment to actively studying and engaging the word of God. So if we're going to embrace the action, the first thing we have to do is we've got to commit to the practice. Notice in Deuteronomy 6, all of the words of instruction, right? Right? Six, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 6, he says what? Put these words in your heart. Repeat them. Talk about them when you sit down, when you walk through the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your head and a symbol on your hand and a symbol on your forehead. Write them. Do you see the level of commitment that God is calling his people to in remembering and engaging his word? What is the purpose of engaging the word of God? It's to direct our minds to think about and practice the things of God and how we relate to one another. A great way to think about this and the commitment to the practice is this. It's the old saying, garbage in, what? Garbage out. What you give yourself to will be reproduced in your life. One of the books that I cite for this uh, quite a bit and one of the books I'll put in the resource center is this Donald Whitney book where he spends, listen to me, the first two chapters, the entire first uh, two chapters of his book on the importance of biblical intake, of committing to the process of engaging the word of God. Why? Because what we study, what our minds spend time processing, determines the kind of habit that is formed in our life. What we think about and what we give ourselves to comes out into our lives. So that's the first thing. We have to commit to the practice of studying God's word. We know God has called us to it. We know that there's evidence it can happen. So now we have to commit ourselves to that process of saying, all right, God, I'm going to give myself to the study of your word so that what I think about and what I focus and what I concentrate on becomes manifest in my own life. It comes from your word, not from me. The second thing under embracing the action is this. We have to focus on the content. We have to center our thoughts around what we are studying. Anybody have a problem in your walk with God when you're praying or studying with the problem of distraction? Anybody get distracted? Some of y'all, have, you ain't answered because you were distracted right now because you wouldn't listen to what I was saying, right? <laughs> distraction. Focusing ourselves on the content Centering our thoughts of what we are studying. Go back to the Shema when we read about that. Look at the expectation and the focus that is given to them. We said it. Repeat these words. Put them in your mouth and put them in your mind, right? Talk about them. Don't just think on them. Talk about them. Have good conversation about them. Not just when you sit down, but when you're walking around or when you go to bed, make sure it is on your mind when you get up. Bind them and write them. Binding, if you all know the practice, these phylacteries are what they were called. There were these boxes that the Jews would wear on their heads. Like they would strap a box to their heads. And they would put boxes on their arms. 
And in those boxes, there were four scriptures, the Shema, two from Exodus and one more from Deuteronomy. They put it physically on their bodies to be reminded of the importance of focusing on the content of the word. Listen, all these things we can do to focus our hearts and our minds on the word of God. If we focus, we focus. I was in an elevator years ago at Spartanburg Regional and I was in the elevator by myself and I was bored. So I started reading the paperwork. And in the, in the, and the only paperwork that's really in the elevator is the elevator certificate of operation. And under and on that piece of metal, and it was really boring reading, let me just tell you, it wasn't very long. But one of the things it says on the plate that goes around it, they used to, I don't know if they still do it, but if they do, check it out. It said this, place in a conspicuous location. And I was like, What? Well, when you place something in a conspicuous location, what does that mean? It needs to be easily seen, right? So when you focus so that people, when they walk in there, they can say, oh, like me who's bored. Hey, this elevator's good. It may crash, but it says it's okay, right? It has to be conspicuous. Inconspicuous is hidden in a way. I think sometimes we try to do that with our with a, with study of the word of God. It doesn't, it's not conspicuous. It's not before us. The phylacteries on the head and on the arms of the, of the Jews were conspicuous. It kept them focused and centered on what God had called them to do. So when we study, when we study, we have to commit to the process, but we have to spend time focusing right here on the word of God. Not what this person said yet, not what this person said, not what I think, but what did God say in these words and repeat them and write them on our hearts. It says the same thing in Ezra. Third thing is this though. Not only do we have to focus on the content, but maybe one of the most important thing is we have to understand the context. Understand the context. Context is important because it places us in the midst of circumstances in which we were not present. You know that when God wrote and gave us his word, there were like real things happening in that moment. Just like there's real things happening right now. Context is important because the deeper we understand the context of the intent and the writing of the author, the more we realize the fullness and the goodness of God in the moment. And we can't truly fully experience it without context. Back in October of 2002, Andre and I were not yet married and we were witness to a miracle. Not the miracle you're thinking of, but it was called the bluegrass miracle. We were at the Kentucky LSU football game and we were winning. We were winning. Last play of the game. The only chance they have is a 74-yard Hail Mary pass for all the glory. They snap the ball. Quarterback rolls back, runs around, throws the Hail Mary. When he throws it from that end, those students and those fans rush the field. We won. Woo-hoo, we're going to win. Andre and I happen to be sitting on the other end of the field, right directly behind the goalposts. And we're watching this ball fly through the air. And I'm watching the LSU receiver. And I look at her and say, he's going to catch it. He's going to catch it. Well, guess what? He caught it. And they won. From the 50-yard line that way, we won. From the 50-yard line this way, we were selling off our possessions because we bought to see that game. It was horrible. And in that moment, there was great celebration. In the same moment, there was horrible defeat. People didn't even know what was going on. And people watched the replays. And we could tell them the story. But unless you were sitting in the stadium, you have no idea what it was really like to watch us lose in the worst way possible. You can hurt for me, but you can't hurt with me. Because we were there. But you know, some people are okay with just hearing about it. They don't want to understand it. Unless you're in the context of the football game that day, you didn't fully understand what it was like. But when we read and study the word of God and we go back to the intent that God has for us in that moment, we may not have been there, but we have a greater appreciation when we know the intent of God and how it is to be played into our lives. Context is important. John chapter eight, verse 32 says that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What's interesting about that verse is this. The truth sets you free, but it is your knowledge of the truth that brings you to your freedom. 
So knowledge of the truth is what sets us free. Knowledge will lead to two critical things in our life, insight and discernment. When we come to see the consistency of God through our study, in the context that we read, we recognize those things in our lives which are not in line with God's design. We see what God is doing. We see how he did it and how he wants for us to do it. Finally, this morning is this. When we go to a habit of study and a discipline of study, we have to reflect and apply truth in our life. We have to reflect and apply truth in our life. Reflection of God's word is going to help us in two ways. In two ways. Number one, we're going to have an opportunity to see our lives from God's perspective. Many, many times we look at our situations from whose perspective? My perspective. The one who's in it, not the one who is over it. And as we get into God's word and we study and we dive deeper into his word, we're going to be able to see what God was doing in other situations and circumstances. And we're going to be able to see uh, and have an opportunity to see our life from his perspective. I don't know about you, but I, when I see my life from my perspective, it doesn't do well. I tend to focus on all the wrong things, whereas God sees our lives above us from every angle. He knows the cause, the purpose, the deliverance that's always there. But second, it helps us to develop some character traits and attitudes. When we stay and apply the truth of God to our lives and we reflect on what God is doing, things like humility are grown in our lives. Things like thanksgiving and conviction and confession. And as we apply the truth of God to our lives, we allow for transformation to begin which is the hint, and and not the hint, but the crux of all that takes place in spiritual discipline. That as we apply this transformation in our lives, we become a product that pursues godliness. But it's because we study and engage the word of God, not simply just read it passively. Although read it, believe me, right? Remember that verse last week? 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. Train yourself for godliness, for the training of the body has limited benefits, but godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds the promise for the present life, but also for the life to come. The crux of the discipline of study is simply this, that we cannot pursue godliness absent and apart from the word of God and a commitment and a devotion to study. The study of God's word, our intake of the word, it sets the course for our faith journey. Now, you may be here this morning, and you may say, you know, I do read my Bible, but, but God, I'll be honest with you, I don't study it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm guilty of from time to time waking up in the morning and being, man, I can't wait to get my devotional because I just need that one nugget of God to get me through the rest of this day. And that's enough. And it's good that God speaks to us that way. I'm not knocking that in any way. But we have everything we need right here. Except maybe the discipline to give it its reverence and do in our lives. So why I say all that? Man, man, I don't study my Bible at all. I'm a horrible person. No, you're not a horrible person. I just want us to see that what God gave us is for our good, not our burden. So resources like Seven Arrows that I mentioned earlier will help you. In this process, we're here to help one another. So maybe you're here and you're just like, you know what? I, I really understand. I love the Lord. I know his word is his word, but it's just not, it's just not where it needs to be in my life. Maybe you just need to come and say, all right, God, develop within me a discipline for your word to study and get into what you're doing in my life. Maybe uh, you don't read your Bible once a week at all. And maybe you also say, all right, God, I can't even begin to study it because I'm not even reading it yet. Maybe you say, God, give me a hunger to read your word. Maybe you just, you're studying the word and you're thankful for what God is doing, but maybe you just want to say, all right, God, I'm studying your word. I'm engaging your word and you're growing me so much. What's next? Help me to see this from a deeper level. Help me to see this world as you see it so that what I am studying and what you are giving me impacts and directs my life as I live it. It's a discipline. It's a study of the word of God. And the only way we really get into it is one bite at a time. Don't study the whole gospel of John. Just study John 3, 16 for a week and see what God does in your life. One bite at a time. 
to grow us closer to God in relationship with him. You pray with me this morning. Father, we love you. And, and God, I thank you for the gift of this day that you've given to us. And, and God, I know it's overwhelming. I know there are, are many people in this room today, um, God, who would, would honestly say, you know what, I'm not even reading my Bible. Some people are like, you know, I study the Bible an hour a day or two hours a day. Remember, God, we all get into the pool a little differently here. But God, if we're in the pool, that means that we're engaged in, in unity somehow. We're all pushing towards a certain purpose. And so, God, there will be some of us who need a little more. Maybe some of us who need a different direction. Maybe some who just need a direction to begin with. But God, can we see this today in our life as not something that is a burden or a struggle or to feel bad about or feel guilty of, but to say that you loved us enough to give us your word and you've given us the ability to study your word so that we can grow closer to you so that we can, God, live in the power of your word. Your word brings life, not burden. And so God, maybe we just need a better reverence for it in our lives. Maybe today, God, there are people here who say, well, yeah, I read my Bible, but it doesn't directly impact the way I live. It should. If we really believe the truth of God's word, then it should change the way that we live. And maybe some of us are just not living changed lives of life. Whatever it is today, God, we give it to you now. Uh, let's pray together. Let's, let's just cover each other in prayer and, and pray collectively, God, for a, a, a drive to be in your word and to know your word so that we may grow closer to you. Whatever you have for us in this moment today, God, we give it to you. We love you. We thank you and we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Will you stand this morning as, as Chris leads? And I'm here to pray with you, pray over you. You allow the Lord to speak to you today.